really need to be thinking about how we can really enable energy efficient computing with domain specific hardware while maintaining the flexibility and also lowering the design cost. This journey really started when I started my PhD at Harvard in 2009. Back then, a senior grad student, Mike Klein, uh, who sat right next to me, and he's also very interested in accelerator design. He had this really cool idea of building a specialized memory system for accelerators. But during our conversation, he complained to me that it's just so hard to evaluate those accelerators. There was no tools available to really capture the behavior of accelerators. Well, this was not only Mike's problem. Back in 2009, the computer architecture community is still largely focused on multi-core architecture, where there's no modeling or simulation infrastructure in thinking about accelerators. That has really inspired us in thinking about how we capture accelerator behavior as an architecture. Together with Brendan Regan and Sam Shi, we worked together in developing one of the earliest generation of a simulation and modeling tools to capture the behavior accelerators at the architecture level. As one of the earliest work in this direction, uh, uh, tools like Aladdin really laid the groundwork of thinking about compatibility across different research projects and also lower the barrier to entry for folks interested in building accelerators. So after seven fun years at Harvard, I graduated in 2016 and got really uh, excited about getting more involved in industry, seeing how industry works, and really building my own hardware. With that, I joined NVIDIA. That was also during the boom of machine learning. At NVIDIA, I see firsthand the excitement, the popularity, and the exponential growth of machine learning in all the different areas. With that, even back then, there were already a lot of machine learning accelerators. What got me really excited is how we can actually support all the different specialized hardware for all the different market segments from edge devices to data sets. At the same time, package level integration, especially with chip based architecture, is also getting more mature. So with that, uh, together with Jason Clements, Greg Baranga, Becca Tisa, and Brian Zimmer, we got really interested in how we can actually build scalable machine learning hardware with the chiplet-based architecture. That has led to the Sigma project. Uh, this is one of the first demonstration of chiplet-based accelerators for machine learning systems. Using only one tape out, a single Sigma chiplet is able to deliver competitive performance compared to edge, device, edge machine learning accelerators like the VDLA, while the entire Sigma package is comparable to data center accelerators like TPU. The Simba project is also a great demonstration of the value of building large-scale collaborative pro project with hardware demonstration. The architecture, circuit, and the methodology components of the Simba project all published and well recognized across different research communities. After three fun and very rewarding years at NVIDIA, I decided to go back to academia and join UC Berkeley as a faculty. At the first place of RISPI, it is really exciting to see the, uh, the opportunities with infrastructure like Chipyard, which make it a lot easier to develop large-scale SOCs with RISPI based CPUs and a range of different accelerators. Also, observing the number of accelerators that's been really growing across all the different platforms, it is pretty really clear the next frontier is really thinking about how we can better integrate accelerators in all the different platforms. That got me really excited, and I was very lucky to get to work with great PhD students. Mike. Mike Hassan Gensch and uh, Jenny Huang, uh, who are also very interested in how we can actually better thinking about system level support to better integrate and program all the different accelerators. That has led to the Gemini project, the first demonstration of machine learning accelerators fully integrated into the SOC to capture all the system level integrations of machine learning and all the other general purpose uh, on memory system substrate. And the COSA infrastructure really thinking about how we can actually better program all those accelerators. Well, this is really the beginning with all the different applications, all the driving scenarios, 
we really need to think about how we can better design, program, and also integrate all the different accelerators together as a coherence. I'm looking forward to working on those interesting and exciting problems with the entire architecture community. Finally, I'm very lucky to have uh, actually worked with many great mentors and collaborators over the past few years, from Harvard to NVIDIA and also at UC Berkeley. Now, the work and this award won't be possible without their generous support. In particular, I'd like to thank my advisor, David Brooks, for nominating me for this award, and uh, even Hickok and Steve Kepler for supporting me and uh, supporting the nomination. With that, I'm going to my talk here. Thank you very much for the opportunity and thank you so much for your support. All right, the uh, 2022 Morris Milk Award recognizes outstanding contribution to computer architecture made by an individual with a computer related professional career started no earlier than January 1st of the year and it's 20 years prior to the year of that award. The committee this year was serving the athletes on group and it was shared by Tim Sherwood. And this year's uh, recipient of Morris Welks is Moin Koreshi from Georgia Tech. For contributions to high performance memories. Thank you, Babak. Uh, research is, we are very lucky to be on research. Research is a very rewarding profession. When you solve a difficult problem, the kick that you get has to be unlike any other. When your ideas get adopted, there is a satisfaction unlike any other. And on top of that, if the community recognizes the work, that's, that's a cherry on top. So I am very thankful, I'm very grateful to the committee. I thank the nominator, the letter writers, you know, the uh, for this award. The award is for contributions to high performance memory systems. So, so you might feel that memory system is something that I was very passionate about and very important to come. No, uh, when I joined UT, my big idea was maybe I'll do masters in VLSI and join Intel. Or my probably would be a VLSI engineer at Intel. But I took the undergrad and grad architecture courses from Professor Gail Hart. And those courses really made me excited about architecture, made me want to go to the Of course, I started on branch prediction, right? Bad idea. For the first four years, first three and a half years, I had zero papers, right? And like, what do you do at that point, right? So couldn't get anything, seriously considering dropping out, right? Uh, when you're a student, if the bar for productivity is how many papers you have, it's a very high bar. Right? Have a paper or don't have a paper, it's nothing in between. So I developed a new metric of productivity. Like, I don't know when my paper will come out. The metric for productivity was read two papers a day. If I read two papers a day, I'm productive. Did that for about three months, read maybe even 100, 150 papers, got interested in caching. There's a lot of cache papers, pretty much new. Tell me anything about 1980, 2005, I don't know what you Got excited about an idea, tried out. Yeah, so tried out an idea. It worked. Maybe I cached my first paper. Well, uh, I can get a second. Uh, so kept working on caching. The problem at that time was that in 2005, caching is already 15 years old. People know that LRH is the best. So why work on caching? That's 
was changing at that time. Beauty of architecture, whenever the constraints change, the solutions change. Instead of a single level cache with multi level caches, instead of a single core, multi cores were coming out. And that fundamentally changed the way we wanted to organize caches, manage caches. So the first piece of work that I want to talk about is something that's very close to my heart. And it was done with my collaborator and good friend, Amar Dhabi. It was the work on adaptive insertion policies uh, using set rule. And the, the key insight of this paper was that the L1 cache measures out the locality. The L2 cache doesn't really have locality. So rather than just installing them and throwing them away without reuse, the goal term being to install them in the LRE position. That's a bad idea if you have reuse. Which one should we do? Well, sample the few sets. Install in LRU, sample the PSF, install in MRU. If you will, whoever is the winner on the sample set, just apply it. Right? So, so it's a very simple idea. It takes like one counter and gives you very good improvement in, in cache organization. So I'm doing something uh, that is used in several processors. The change to the fundamental thing that changes, well, LRU is not the best policy, force fight out. Rather than giving more space to something that wants more space, give more space to something that really needs more space. Get a better hit rate. So we develop trackers that can figure out what the utility is and then decide how much to give things for. And then when I joined IBM in 2007, one big problem there at that time was that power seven processors had a four megabyte private cache. So you have eight like, private caches, and if you're not really using your cache, you wouldn't give it away, but then the problem that was there was that if everybody lends and everybody borrows, it doesn't really make sense to do it. If you're a borrower, you should not lend. If you're a lender, you should not borrow, right? How do you know which one is the lender and which one is the borrower? You set the role, figure out which is the best decision for you for maximizing your audit, right? So the innovation in these ideas was set role, set sampling, and this idea was in power seven. The next change happened is for serendipity. I decided that I didn't want to work in caching. What should I work on? At IBM, there, those days, there was this thing called a storage class memory. Device people were talking about it. So I went to VG Srinivas. I said, you know, these people talk about SCM, SCM. What is this? I don't see any architecture work in this. So, so we started looking at it. Right? Patient memory gets more capacity, but it's slow, for read, for write, there's a lot of problems. So we came up with hybrid memory. Right? You have DRAM that filters out more possible accesses and PCM can still give you more capacity. Right? So the hybrid memory architecture that was proposed in that paper is, is right, right now the de facto design for NPMs. One of the big problems for patient memory is it has limited lifetime. And I collaborated with a lot of people at IBM, including John Kyrdas, uh, Michele Franceschini, Louis Lastras, Murat Adali, Vijay Srinivasan, uh, and we developed uh, a very lovely algorithm that did not require table scope. Very lovely is a known problem, flash, but table based very lovely doesn't really work for this. We figured out a way to avoid table There's a bunch of work on PCM again. The third line of work that we did. And it's again happened just because of serendipity. In 2007, 2011 micro, Martin was presenting the local cash. I was the session chair. This was the first work that really explained the problem of how to organize DRAM cash. They really organized DRAM cash as a regular set of social cash. A lot of fun, interesting questions back and forth with Mark, with Gabe. And we came up with a design that was just a complete rethinking. Instead of social that cache, just make a direct map cache, stream out the target data together. This could not only outperform conventional set associated caches, it actually outperform an impractical SRAM cache that requires like 50 megabytes of SRAM. And this is now the design that was actually used in a similar design was used in as a young academic. This was a very fertile area of research for my students. My, one of my first earlier students got up in this area. They went, went on to industry. Um, so memory system is very close to my heart. Right? Uh, 
and a lot of the learning in this area would not be possible for an incredible set of people that I got a chance to work with. First and foremost, my students. I, I'm really lucky to work with an incredibly motivated set of students. They, they, they teach me a lot. Second, my mentors have been there for the years, helped me in many different ways. There are many I cannot really enumerate everybody because I'm sure I'll miss out somebody. There's one person I do want to remember, uh, late Professor Dayala Manchali. He's an incredible mentor, incredible human being. Also been lucky to have a great set of collaborators from whom I learn. Many of them became very close friends. The many of you, uh, I do want to mention one, Amir, who has been there, not only my soundboard, but a good friend. He's like, he's like my family. Finally, I want to thank my family. Uh, I come from a family which had very little access to education. I was the first generation high school, college, MS. With very little changes in my life, I would probably be running a small budget shop. So I'm incredibly lucky to have a strong set of support. I thank my family and especially my sister Mona, who's been there for years, my wife, Lubna and Nikra, and uh, I, I want to thank my parents. Uh, both of them never went to school, but they understood the importance of education and instilled the importance of education. And that's one of the reasons why I'm a professor. Uh, I dedicate this. Thank you. My pleasure to present the this good influential paper award. Uh, the this good influential paper award recognizes the paper um, fifteen years ago from this 2007 that has had the most impact on the field in terms of research, development, products, or ideas in the intervening years. And the way it was selected was that candidate papers were selected from. Uh, in 2007 by the ISCA program committee. And the final decision was made by uh, myself, uh, Sigar Karen Bavik, and the CA Karen Simon. So I'm very pleased to announce that the 2022 Electric Paper Award goes to Power Positioning for a Warehouse Size Computer by Shabo Fan, Karen Clever, Sandra Grosso. And this is a paper that really just started the whole field. So I'm going Thank you, Brad. Yeah, thank you, committee. Yeah, here along. I'm Xiao Bo, fan, uh, software engineer at Google. So here, along with my Bob Weber and Bruce Broso, we're truly honored for the committee to give us a recognition. So today, I'm gonna just share a short journey, also something you might find helpful. Yeah, this is definitely more exciting than getting the paper accepted by the conference. Yeah, but the downside is you have to wait for 15 years. <laughs> 
All right, so if you're ever short of research ideas, you might want to start mar marrying something you have never married before. So this is a bit of the advice that uh, made us to start this paper and also led to uh, this kind of impact. So we started the work 15 years ago after noticing how rarely our data center machines consume energy approaching to their peak utilization we have a provision for. So this led us to study how likely a group of server machines approaches high power utilization and the probability, how the probability varies across different data center workloads and as the machine number of machines changes. So we yeah in this large field study and we realized Actually, the machine utilization, actually we, we realized the data center power utilization actually can be giving us huge opportunity to deploy more machines than the data center is strategically designed for. Or conversely, we can build fewer number of data centers if we can manage the risk of having the entire data center at different level reach into their theoretical power limit. So shortly after the paper is published, we uh, we started building a power, a very robust power capping system in Google, Google's data centers to achieve all the goals set in the set forth in this paper. Now, another impact is beyond actually just power management. It's also in this paper we first noticed how inefficient our hardware components are actually consuming power if they are not operating at their peak power utilization. So this, yeah, so recognize, yeah. A subsequent journal paper named this effect energy proportionality and challenged our field in responding to this challenge by making our computer system more power efficient. And this challenge was answered by both industry and academia and has resulted in dramatic reduction in energy con consumption in computing systems and in particular in data center servers. So this award also gives us a chance to thank both industry and academia community uh, groups who have studied the energy proportional proportionality problem and also improved the power efficiency across all software hardware layers in the last 15 years. It's also in this paper, the concept of <coughs> warehouse scale computing was first introduced, coined by also Louis pioneered this new design paradigm where a data center is not viewed as just a building of lots of computers, but as a single giant holistic warehouse size computer, elevating the disjoint data center design into a more holistic architecture, computer architecture problem. So finally, we want to thank again to the committee for this recognition. Of course, thanks to our Google colleagues for building this the basic power provisioning and power having system. Thank you all. So next we have the ISCA best paper. So the ISCA best paper were actually was made for the first time. Uh, it recognizes some outstanding research presented at the conference. Uh, the selection process uh, uh, is uh, created where the program chair identifies the top three papers uh, based on a normalized score. And then uh, the basic reviewers of the candidates have been asked to support those papers uh, for uh, a best paper nomination. And then we uh, ranked the papers and selected the top four to five papers, which you saw in the best paper nominee session. And a best paper award selects the winners. Uh, the award committee has drawn from uh, the not reviewers and not reviewers. And the award committee has given this winner's answer award to the committee itself. And the best paper is. Uh, BMR. 
that's a uh, non-volatile memory. All right, uh, now we go to the 2022 ACM Cigar Talent de Berm. So the Alan D. Birnbaum Award was named after uh, Alan, who uh, did a phenomenal amount of service as a cigar uh, officer for many years in this community. Uh, he served from 1997 to 2000, Seven. He was secretary and treasurer from 93 to 99, chair from 99 to 2003. For the past year, for another four years, uh, he was on the SIG governing body and he created a lot of initiatives that today uh, members of our community benefit from, uh, including the Worst Books Award, uh, the ISCA proceedings on the Judicial Library, and uh, the Penny Grants for Diversity and Inclusion. Alan was basically the founder of the first set of initiatives we had in the community for diversity to uh, provide grants. Uh, and he was also the inaugural winner of the Civil Service Award. So the uh, award recognizes an individual who has contributed important service to the community this year with for Wen Mei Hu, uh, Gabe Lowe, and Tiffany Pinkston as the chair. This year's award goes to Catherine McKinley from Google. For elevating awareness and mitigating harassment and discriminatory behavior and for advancing best practices to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion in our computer architecture and broader computing community. Thank you. So why am I here today? Why am I a member of the architecture and ASPLOS and Yale communities after so many women have left? Why am I here? Service starts with research excellence. My papers got in. I had an incredible 100% hit rate on my first four submissions. Sadly, I was not able to maintain that rate. <laughs> But there were plenty of acceptances to validate I was choosing important problems and making research contributions. Next is social belonging. I had an amazing group of peers in my grad school with many women, and we were very supportive of each other. Early mentors believed in me. Don Johnson inspired my research career with a summer undergraduate research experience. My advisor, Ken Kennedy, gave me good problems initially and then let me pick my own problems. So several of the faculty at Rice uh, were openly sexist against me. And those, those experiences were countered by those other positive experiences, especially my good uh, fortune in my early acceptances. Dave Stemple, my first department chair at the University of Massachusetts, made it possible for me to combine motherhood with tenure track, assistant professor, and I went overboard and had three children. So, social belonging also came from established members of the research community, such as Dennis Gannon and David Padua, who wrote letters for me all throughout my career, Susan Eggers, Mark Hill, Elliot Boss, Artie Rosenberg, David Wood, the MIT Anand Agarwal, that it, who, who strongly supported my first ASPLOS paper and really set me on a career to have success at ASPLOS. Jack Davidson, Mary Lou Sofa, Mary Jean Harold, Mark Horowitz, who sought me out like again last night and asked me about my work and 
made sure he talked to me, Joel Emmers, and these people, they weren't just nice to me. They cited my work, they took me seriously, and they were just amazing mentors and role models for me. Service is a privilege offered based on your research. Like Alan Berenbaum's legacy, my advisor, Ken Kennedy, inspired service to the community and the country. He was the chair of the Presidential Information Technology Advisory Committee, which led to critical investments and my first large ITR grant on the DeCapo project. So when given the opportunity to serve as AFPLUS chair soon after tenure, I took it. Based on social science research showing that double blind, reviewing improved fairness and decision quality, reducing all sorts of biases, I took the initiative, which was resisted at some levels, but I still got my way to start double blind submission at ASPLOS and then in the PL community. I also became very active in CRA on what is now called CRAWP, the Winding Participation Committee. I spoke at many events. Just this morning, I got an email from someone eight years ago who found that useful. So that was good news. I spoke, I raised a lot of funding for programs such as grad cohort and research experiences for undergraduates to increase the participation of more types of people in computing and to interrupt the downward slide of women's participation. Together with Tracy Camp, we established the Center for Evaluating Research Pipeline Intervention Programs, and we showed a bunch of them worked, and, but they were not enough. Then ahead of the Me Too movement, Natalie and Kim wrote their Sigarch blog on women's participation. Soon thereafter, Micro yet again had no women on its GC or PC, no women on its panels or keynote speakers. We were lit up. Margaret Marginosi was our spokesperson, although negotiating a time to speak at Micro was, was way too challenging. We found it particularly discouraging that reporting harassment at a conference required sending email to, to an anonymous ACM address or speaking to a general chair or, or program chair who may have no training in this area. A huge thank you to Sarita, where is Sarita? Where are you, Sarita? Writing her grant, probably. All right. <laughs> Thank you, Sarita. <laughs> Thank you, Sarita. Can we give Sarita a hand here for CARES? So without Sarita, CARES wouldn't have been formed. She worked tirelessly with ACM and her SIG RTC worked with her to establish CARES to help people. Margaret and I gladly served as the first co-chairs. These committees have spread through the computing community. CARES committees have raised awareness of racial and sexual bias, harassment, and, and of ethic, unfortunately of ethical problems in our community. CARES has provided support to many individuals who were considering reporting and helped some of them report. And we've seen some consequences. Unfortunately, social change comes slowly, but I believe our community is headed in the right direction. I wanna give a special thank you to my husband, Scotty Strickham, who sacrificed so much for my career and my sons. I also wanna thank my team of supporters. Mary Hall, a chair at, at the University of Utah. Kathleen Fisher. I'm sorry. It's so beautiful to me. Thank you so much. So I have my executive council who have been my steadfast friends and colleagues, role models and wise counsel. These include Mary Hall, who's now the chair at Utah, Kathleen Fisher, who's now a DARPA director, Kathy Fletcher is an OpenStack PM. My longtime colleague, Steve Blackburn, is now a Google scientist and ANU professor, and Mark and Margaret Martinosi, you would have at AD at NSF. We all started together as young 
women in the field, except for Steve, who joined me later. And my husband says he's an honorary chick. Okay. So I'm here to many good experiences. And despite ongoing discouraging sexism in the community, And if you haven't read the blog, it's time to read it. I wish these experiences would stop. I challenge all of you to be the agent of change in our community, to spread acceptance and belonging. This is your community. Thank you. All right, uh, now, the 2022 Eckerd Mockley Award. Uh, I'm actually here representing the uh, committee chair, Natalie, and right here, be here, and none of the committee members make it, so on, on behalf of her, uh, I'm going to <laughs> okay, we know who it is. It was announced on Friday. So, what does it recognize? It recognizes outstanding contributions to computer and digital systems architecture, where the field of computer architecture is considered to encompass the combined hardware, software, and design, which is a lot more important now than it was 20 years ago, and analysis of computing digital systems. The committee was shared with Natalie. And it included Kim Hazelwood, David Cayley, Steve Keckler, Lucy Kay, and Steve Weinhardt. And both of them this. Uh, the 2022 Edgar Award winner is Mark Horowitz, Stanford University of Contribution to Microprocessor Memory Systems. So I, I, I first have to read a note. Uh, on behalf of the committee, uh, the, the note that uh, Natalie said to me, in 1990, Mark co-founded Rambus with Mark Farmwell to pioneer high bandwidth DRAM interfaces. This work was the first to identify the processor DRAM interface as a key bottleneck that required architecture and circuit optimization together. Modern DRAM interfaces such as SDDR and LPDR were strongly influenced by his techniques. Mark's deep insights at the intersection of architecture and circuits have profoundly influenced the field. He demonstrated the growing importance of wire delay in systems and large memories throughout uh, his landmark paper, The Future of Wires, in 2001. He has led research recognizing the, the future performance energy progress after the end of uh, the NARC scale would require greater use of hardware accelerators. And finally, Mark pioneered work in smart memories and early processor memory design. Many of today's domain specific architectures built on this concept. Please join me in congratulating Mark on this recognition. All I can say is, wow. Uh, I, I really was shocked by the award. I always consider myself a PLSI hack. Architect, and it's so nice to actually consider part of the group. So, thank you so much for being here. It's really amazing. Okay, well, um, as I often do, I left it to the last minute and I thought I was going to bring the laptop up, but evidently not. So, um, We'll start this without slides, but that's okay. It doesn't really need the slides. Yeah. We're going to connect this laptop here. So,
All right. So um, while we're setting up the Zoom link, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, my career. And you might think that I would focus on the computer architecture part of my career. But the honest answer is I think you guys know much more about computer architecture than I do. So I was trying to think about what I could say that might be of interest to this community and useful, because I have a big thing about giving talks that basically are worth the time you spend listening to them. So you can judge me at the end about whether I accomplished my task or not. So I decided to, to title the talk, The Advantages of Episodic Overconfidence and Great Colleagues. And I, I focus on the episodic, because I have people who are just overconfident, they drive me crazy. I would say my overconfidence is very much a thing. Like I have given a zillion talks, but I'm still extremely nervous right now, especially because I don't have the Zoom in the camera. We did it, we did it, we did it. Thank you so much. Um, that's the easiest applause I ever got. Okay, so I'm gonna start off when I was really young. And when I was really young, I would get toys. And the question is, guess which one I played with? The toy or the box? The box, because I was really interested in how things work, even when I was a little kid. And I figured out that I could find out how things worked by breaking like throwing them against the floor. Didn't make me very popular as a kid, I'm sure um, But then when you broke it, you couldn't play with it anymore. But the box was sort of more fun. But what I learned, actually not quickly enough for some, but that throwing things against the ground or using a technique to using a technique that basically destroyed things was not very useful. It was informative, but not very useful. And then you should try to figure out a way that allowed you to use that knowledge that you gained in a better way. I also learned, it's really important, that if you're going to try to break things, use broken stuff first, because people get less pissed at you if you take something apart that's already broken. Okay, now, this talk is going to have a number of epiphanies. These aren't things that I learned at the time, but looking back over my life, I've decided. The first thing that was most important is, if someone put something together, there's a way to take it apart. And what I mean that is not just physically, but meta, you know, just more generally. If someone builds something, there's a way to understand how it works. And that has really guided me in my entire career, this belief that you can understand a complicated object and therefore take and make use of that knowledge. The other thing that I tell all my students is don't believe everything you read. Because I, as a, as a kid, would read those signs and say, caution, do not open, right? But I'm old enough to remember when there were tubes, and tubes, you always open, you had to replace the tubes. Tube systems were way more dangerous than higher voltage, and they were somehow getting hard, okay? But because you didn't need to open them, people didn't want you to open them, okay? But that also means that people are always hiding things. And when you read something, you have to read it critically. And I think that's really important to you when you take a hard box. The second point, the next thing I learned was that learning really does come from failure. And I know everybody says that, but you know, I don't think people really internalize it as much as I do. Because when I was young, I had actually mastered taking things apart. So I knew there were screws and you shouldn't break plastic and stuff like that. But I got a watch and I took the watch apart and I was being very careful. All the screws on my mom's kitchen table. When I loosened like the second screw, things went 
I had forgotten to undo the mainspring, or I didn't forget. I didn't know that you forgot to undo the mainspring. I'll tell you, I'll never forget that. Right? And I looked very carefully, and there is this, you know, mechanism on most watches like the cool breathing pressure and stuff like that. So it's really important to fail. Now, once you take things apart, you get to have ideas. Like that's just a mailing tape. Um, and I meant to bring one because I wanted to demo it, but I forgot to bring one. Um, it's just a mailing tube. And I started thinking, well, what happens if you try to move the tube? So I grab the tube and move it at the top, which is kind of fall off the air pressure. You know what happens next, right? I thought, what happens if I hold the top on as I compress the tube? Well, what happens is the top flies off at high velocity which I discovered in my living room of my parents' house. I had my mom run down and say, what the heck was that? And told me I had to do it outside and then on. But this is a great, very simple device. And it's fun to build. And I demo it in my intro to making class at Stanford, just to give people an idea of the kinds of things you can do. Really clear. Back in the dark ages, when I started all this, I was really interested in technologies and doing things. And the new technology at the time were actually transistors and integrated circuits. Um, now, that stuff was pretty expensive, and my family was not very wealthy. So, put it in So, fortunately for me, this is the thing about great colleagues. My uncle happened to work at that time in Princeton in the accelerator program, and he built um, particle detectors. So he had access to very expensive electronics, and he would show me stuff and give me some stuff to play with. And that was awesome. Now, usually people of that generation build radios. But I couldn't build radios because that blue arrow over there is basically where I live. That red square next to it was WTOP, a 50,000 watt AM radio station at um, 1600 on your AM dial, which is 1.6 megahertz. You don't call that AM anymore. Um, anyhow, what it meant is that anything I built could get WTOP. I could put an earphone in my ear and hold the end of the cord and get WTOP. Okay? I couldn't get anything but WTOP. So building radios was not that interesting to me. So I decided I needed to do something more noise immune, and I started digital logic. That's how I got into digital logic. Okay, now about stretching, being a little overconfident, this was a circuit I submitted to MIT on my admission. It was an XOR game that I thought I had made much better than anybody else. I'm sure you can't read this because this has bipolar transistors in, which we never deal with and all this other stuff. But the thing is, it doesn't work. I, you know, I built it and I tested it and it does work, it did work, but it has degradation from input to output and a bunch of other things. I don't know why they still accepted me. Either the person who got the application never looked at it, or they must have thought, you know, this guy, Scott, must be really creative or something. But, you know, failing is okay. You can make mistakes. It costs you to work. Okay. The problem, as I said, was my family didn't have very much money. Um, I didn't have funding to go to MIT. My mom said I could go to whatever college I wanted. She was going to pay for the University of Maryland. Okay. So I needed a summer job. I did lifeguarding once, but that was way too boring for me. Um, I was very lucky to get a job with the National Bureau of Standards, which is now NIST. And in particular, Bob Pocket, and I, I just searched it, and that's a picture of what he looked like when I worked with him, um, was in the metrology group at the Bureau of Standards. And he was another crazy guy who liked building things. And so we had a great time together. And this led a pattern that I've repeated my entire life, where I start off on board, I do four pieces. I read about some interesting new technique. I get really excited about that new technique. I really want to try it out. I badger colleagues to let me do it or funding agencies to pay for it, right? This is the overconfident thing. Then, when they once say yes or give me money, I go into the panic, what the hell have I done phase, and figure out how am I ever going to accomplish what I promised. So, initially, I procrastinate a lot because I hate failing. 
anything until I'm so embarrassed by the amount of time that I haven't done anything that I start building things and start working on it. And then I'm so convinced it's going to fail, I rush to get it done so I can find the damn bug to get rid of it. Right? And trust me, <laughs> there are always many. But somehow, once you're into it, you figure out ways around it and then you get to work. And I finish that cycle and then I get bored again. And the cycle repeats. So, my first major design at the Bureau of Standards, that's Sandra Greer, who was another person I collaborated with. And if you look over here, this is a pen prodder. We didn't have digital data logging back then, right? People plotted things. If you notice, there are actually two things on this curve. There's this really line that goes up and down. That's the output of the very precise, very expensive digital voltage meter that was metrics. And then you'll see a line that kind of goes down the center, which is kind of the average. That's the result of a digital filter that took the output of the Okay, that's the filter that I built. Um, we won't go into details of how, how I built it, but you know, it's a bunch of TTL built components that did it. And that allowed them to basically read their measurements. Okay. But this was one of those things that I read about digital filters. I said, oh, I could do that. I built it. Uh, the first one I built worked, but it shouldn't have. You know, it's one of those things that I thought I could pitch in it, but it was boring, you know. Anyhow, so something can look like. Um, so as a result of working at MBS, I built a ton of uh, uh, instruments and controllers. Uh, honestly, today, I could have written a little code on our Arduino and done almost everything I did, probably better. But Arduinos didn't exist back then. I learned a ton about noise and measurements and building systems. But mostly, it gave myself gave me confidence that I could actually be successful. And I think that was incredible. So at the Bureau of Standards, I learned probably the most important thing that I've ever learned, which is don't follow instructions. When you have a job, the job will tell you that your job is X. It is true you need to do X. But if you view your job as X, you're missing out. Like when I got to the Bureau, they had a bunch of things for me to do, and I did those things. And then I was bored. Okay, so I spent time reading or talking to them, learning about what they were doing. It wasn't really part of the job, I was just left, but I learned about equation states. And, and from that, I could think about other things to do. And more importantly, I grew. I gained skills I never had. So when you have a job, doing your job is only part of what you should do. Every job you do, you should be thinking and talking to people outside what you have to do to learn more, to make you more valuable in the next year or the next thing. I just think that's incredibly important. It's okay, it's even user. Okay. The other thing that happened is that, you know, at the Bureau, I would be reading these magazines, trade rags, looking at circuits, not actually understanding them. So what happened was, when I went to MIT, I was a very unusual student, because in the classes that everybody's going, why the hell are they teaching me this math, right? And I was going, oh, so that's why that thing worked. And as a result, I really appreciated in a much deeper sense what was going on than my colleagues. That led me to the second thing. It's, it's like, I hate busy work. I really despise it. So when I would get homework, I would do the homework. But if it seemed like I had a lot of algebra or something to do, and I got a really simple answer, I always figured out there must be a simpler way to do it. Okay. And so I would spend enormous amounts of time, I, you know, nobody else would do this, but I spent tons of time trying to figure out what is the quickest way to get from the starting point to the end. And for me, it wasn't work. It was not just as a puzzle of my books on the But people think I'm really smart. I'm not smart. I just spent a lot of time working out how to be lazy. Because I do much less work than almost anybody else does. But I just know a bunch of tricks, right? So this, this sort of gave rise to my sort of third epiphany, which is that if I'm trying to teach something, if, you're, if you want somebody to learn something, don't tell them what the answer is. Let them struggle with the problem first. Let them think about how they might attack it. Let them try the ways that they have. Because after you've dealt with the problem, grab with it a little bit, then if I tell you some analysis techniques that are useful for looking at that problem, 
the, the person who struggled with it will better appreciate it and better attain those things than if you just told them, here's the way to resolve it. Okay. The second corollary of that um, is that getting the answer is only part of the journey. Understanding why the answer is the answer is really the point of the story. And I, I'm sorry, guys, but I think sometimes this community is a little too interested in the answer or the data. I think sometimes we need to take, take a step back and think more about what this means in a, a bigger context. I ended up at MIT writing two theses. I, I ended up getting a PS and MS degree mostly because as a graduate student, they pay me and I was paying them. And as I said, I didn't have to apply money. Um, I really liked my bachelor's work because it was a puzzle that I solved and I really understood. My master's, I took a lot of data and didn't understand it very much. And this is something that somebody told me at, at MIT Lincoln Labs that it's been true, is that the paper quality is often inversely proportional to time. If you have an idea and you really understand what it is, it doesn't take that long to explain it. If you don't really understand what you're doing and you have a lot of data, you present a lot of data. And my bachelor's thesis was about half of like, my master's thesis. And I really think that was directly inverse. So in the late 70s, I came to Silicon Valley because I was interested in integrated circuits. I worked at a company called Synetics. Um, I worked on actually like polar stuff, but it doesn't really matter. And, you know, design tools at the time was we had circuits in the kitchen. Everything else you think about doing design didn't exist. Verilog didn't exist. I'm just full. Um, so I ended up becoming an academic, but it was very strange. I was actually at a company I never thought I would be a professor. What happened was I had a job. It wasn't a good company. I met Bob Dutton, who was a faculty member at Stanford, an amazing guy. He suggested I apply to Stanford. I thought MIT was fun. I had fun at school. I didn't like my current job. I hate moving. So I ended up as to do a student at Stanford. Now, this gives you an indication about how far in advance I planned my life. We'll come back to that. Okay. So now I'm a PhD student. I'm working on IC CAD tools. I focused on resistance extraction, wrote some papers, but I was bored. It wasn't that interesting to me. I ran into Rob Matthews, who is a VLSI professor. He asked me something about timing. I thought this was a really interesting question. Um, I switched my thesis topic. Um, you know, mid-career was the best thing I ever did. Then I met Paul Penfield, or I knew Paul from MIT when I was at MIT, but I started working with him because he had just done this great work. Um, and I learned the most important thing about talking with Paul, which is in talking with Paul, he had done some work. I had figured out something out. I talked to him about it. And then we both invented something, or I thought I invented it. And I thought I told him about it, but then he, he wrote back and told me that he invented something. Right. So the thing I learned, and I'm so glad it happened early in my career, is that Paul is a wonderful guy. He was very kind. He put my name on his, you know, the archival paper, which is one of my most famous papers now. Um, so the thing is, there's a huge advantage to trusting people. Two people really can independently invent something. Arguing over who invented it first is a bloody waste of time. It doesn't matter. There are very few people in the community that actually steal stuff. It's not zero, but it's not large. If you just assume people will be honest and respectful, you will go so much farther in your career than if you're trying to be protective of your ideas. Because you get so much more from sharing than than Okay, so I now I'm a PhD student, I have research I want. A colleague of mine, John Redford, for the Digital Equipment Corporation, a company that used to be um, suggests I could teach a TA VLSI class. Jack invites me to teach this class. Okay, then, well, invites me to be a TA for the class. Then they call me up and say, you know, forget about it. Um, we found better people. I'd already told my mom I was going to come out to the East Coast. Uh, Chuck Seitz was going to teach the class, and I really liked Chuck. So I figured. I called them up and say, if I pay my way, can I attend the class? They say yes. Um, Chuck and I really hit it off. 
and they end up offering me the gig for the next teaching thing. Uh, I taught the class. I watched a video of myself teaching the class. It was the most awkward and kind of embarrassing thing I've ever done in my life. I had so many speech impediments. I won't go through them all now. Um, it was horrible. Remember, this was an age before YouTube and you know Instagram and all that stuff. So I had never seen myself on video. Um, but the funny thing was, is I'm an introvert, but I kind of liked being on stage. And I thought teaching might be something I liked. And I really liked people getting things that I explained, like the best talk. And I thought, well, maybe I should become a doctor. OK, so my, my sixth epiphany is that you need to ask for what you want. Like when Dex said no, you know, I, I realized that wasn't what I and I figured they probably said no because they didn't want to pay the money. Okay. So I just said, could I do it? You know, lots of times I think people make decisions for other people. They don't ever make decisions for other people. My best manager that I ever worked with would constantly come to me and ask me to do things that he knew I could do. But he would explain them to me and I'd end up doing them. So if you want to do something, don't expect somebody else to figure it out. Gotta do it. You gotta take the and the other thing that I learned from this whole thing is don't let ego get in the way. I have an ego, trust me. Uh, it was a little hurt on this whole episode. And if I thought that they were bad people or anything like that, I would never have the opportunity to be in the world. So just keep it. Okay. Then I get to Stanford. I'm a faculty member at Stanford. I joined the faculty in 1984, and that you might not recognize it's John Hennessy when they had more hair. Okay. John is the number one person in the reason I'm in this space right now. He has been an amazing mentor for me. And what I always say about John is there are two kinds of leaders those leaders that step forward when something good happens, and those are leaders that step back. John has had a tradition of fostering and mentoring a ton of people. When good things happen, he pushes them. And as a result, okay. so, anyhow, just, anyhow, the problem was when I joined, the two people who were teaching me lost my classes at Stanford left. And John left to start the computer systems. So I ended up running John's DARPA project as a as, you know assistant professor, former student. And I, I label this time if I don't die of computer experience because I worked, I, mean, I didn't know anything about managing. I designed part of the chip because, you know, I was just formerly a student here designing chip. I you know, that front of the group that do everything else. So, like, every month or two, I would go home and say, Why am I doing this? I'm not sleeping or doing anything. And I sleep the weekend and I go, Oh, I guess things are okay. <laughs> but the result is the MIPSEX chip, which is like my first really big chip that I did. That's the team of students that worked on it with me. I'm the person dead center. Um, Paul Chow had just visited China and came back to um, uh, Mao Hats. So that's why we're all here. But you know, in the group, in the back corner, in the back uh, left corner, that's an uncle um, who had you know, the first cash papers. Sitting in the front row, looking like he's asleep, is Stephen Shabilsky, uh, who did all the multi-level cash hard work. Um, uh, Peter Stinkesty is in the middle, Malcolm Wing, Don Starr. These are all people who have had enormous careers with uh, the industry. Paul Chow is the person next to me in the front row, uh, a student uh, colleague at University of Toronto. So it was a great group of people to work with. Um, after six years at Stanford, um, I was getting involved for again. I met Mike Farmwald, who uh, was mentioned earlier. He was another Stanford PhD. He's crazy. Uh, he's barely tethered to reality, which means he has a bunch of ideas. The thing that's unique about Mike is that if you prove to him that his idea is bad, he'll drop it. But if you just tell him it's a bad idea, he is the most tenacious person. So um, he basically talked about the gap uh, between DRAM performance and 
CPUs that lots of people have been talking about. But what he pointed out that was really important was that if you looked at the number of DRAMs in a system over time, that number was actually dropping. So we're in a situation where the gap between uh, DRAM speed was increasing and processor speed, but the number of DRAMs you could have in the system would be going down, which meant that we somehow had to get much more data out of each DRAM. And we did this in 1990, which was a little ahead of the curve. So um, I didn't really want to start a company, but Mike did, and I figured, well, it seems like fun. And so it was my only experience in sales. So between 1990 and 1991, Mike and I, the Red, we talked to Nero manufacturers and systems about this idea. We were called crazy many times. Uh, we were making the DRAMs more complicated, which everybody knew was a stupid thing to do because everybody wanted DRAMs to be really cheap. Uh, but we needed the DRAMs to have more than 10x the bandwidth that the current DRAMs were coming. Um, it wasn't all bad. Um, the point is that when people told us I was crazy, this is the episodic overconfidence. You listen really carefully because you're trying to figure out, do they know something you don't know? Okay? And if they tell you something you didn't think about, you better think about it. But if they tell you things that you already have considered, then it's okay because basically they're, they're not finding new flaws. By 1991, we had signed up a DRAM company. And if you want a longer story about what happens when you actually try to start a company and all the stuff that happens, but you know, I haven't talked about it. But the 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 the, the thing that I really learned from Real Bus, which um, blew my mind, was that you really do compute you create the computer. Now I know people have said this, but it always seemed to be in a bumpo jumbo way. I'm a you know I'm an engineer. I build stuff with me I'm creating future is right what you believe actually does change what happens. And what you do changes what happens. So sometimes what you say isn't right or wrong. Like we were saying to people that this technology is the best thing to apply spread. Well, if enough people believed it, it was gonna be true. But if nobody took it, it was not true. And and you know, I really think this is one of the biggest problems with some of my students at Stanford who are not doing well. They believe they can't do the material because they believe they can't do the material when they start working in it because it's complicated or it doesn't seem like it's working out. They give up because they know they can't do it. Or another student gets to it and it's a little complicated, they persevere and they follow it. So your perception really does matter. Okay, since returning to Stanford 30 years ago, I continue to take advantage of some interesting opportunities. That included Stanford Dash multiprocessor. If you just look, read the list of names there, Dan Linowski, who basically built a whole bunch of ICA routers, James Loudon, uh, architecture of Roche, Wolf was one of these people, and John, I mean, it was, it was a fabulous work to work with. Um, then we built, you know, another, now the overconfidence, we thought, oh, oh, we built the chip. We could build another chip that had a whole process. The PP is a processor. It was like a whole SOC with a bunch of interfaces. And not only can we build the chip, we're going to put it into a system that really had to work. Like, um, you know, making, putting a chip and getting it to work is one thing. Building a chip that actually works in a system that puts an operating system uh, in the home side, that is another thing that works. And then, you know, we managed to pull it through. And then, you know, I didn't build enough chips and do enough coherence protocols. You know, once we did the uh, distributed shared memory stuff, well, why don't we just do transactional memory and distributed shared memory and that's the best thing all together. And so we built another chip and that chip actually is a four processor, multi processor. Yeah. Um, and then in addition to that, we ended up doing lots of other fun things that I, I think are not fun. But in conclusion, I just want to say, please take advantage of the opportunities that present themselves. Believe in yourself, it really does matter. Um, but don't believe in yourself so much that you don't listen to other people, right? It's the episodic overconfidence that's really important. So take risks, but then listen to feedback and get improvements. Because even if you don't agree with it, if you can understand where the criticism is coming from, you will do much better 
and improving things in the theater. So, in the end, who is Mark Horowitz? Who am I? I'm just a kid who really likes to break things and take things apart. And I still worry about being being able to do what either I claim or, unfortunately, now my position like what other people expect of me because it's somewhat daunting. Thank you all for your attention. So we're going to hand the certificate to Mark first, and then we'll have uh, questions. So and A's, we have some volunteers here for microphones. Just raise your hand. We'll come to you. And I'm, I'm happy to talk about any architecture. I'm happy to talk about future technology, something that I'm very interested in, what's happening in ICs and chiplets and stuff like that. So go at it, right? And especially to the students here, don't be shy. Mark, we have even Jordan. So previously, technology was always in the Now we have seen the technology that things were just become crafty, crafty. They were great by themselves. How do we make them work? <laughs> oh, okay, so this is this, this is really a, an interesting question. So what happens as technology is getting less reliable than the percent? So my answer to this question is pretty simple. Um, the industry wants better stuff. So technology won't get, we're not gonna scale to a technology with things so crappy that things are working because that's not economically viable. Um, so I think what's happening is that things aren't getting worse necessarily. We're building more and more complicated systems with time, depending on more and more stuff to do our tasks that we notice the crappy stuff that we've been dealing with. Right, so the whole thing yesterday about these systems, like Google has built huge data center stuff and they've been using this stuff, but they built their systems to be robust, right? When you're starting to run VMs and people's applications on VMs, those systems are maybe not as robust, but that's part of the problem. So I, I do think that the way we're going to resolve this is a combination of the technology and the mitigation, because we are not going to move to technology that we can't actually use. So I think the question is somewhat reversed, which is, what can we do as architects or something to allow people to use cheaper technologies, essentially less reliable technologies? And if we can figure out how to do that, I think it will be extremely important because that will make it cheaper and people will do it, right? But it's, we're not going to be thrust in an environment where things are much worse than they are now because why would we do that? Hi. Eric Bernbaum, so I'm over, over this direction. Oh, again, uh, from the University of Utah and also National Science Foundation. Um, I'm struck by how many of the projects that you were talking about involve in actually building things and measuring the, the artifact. And if you look at sort of recent and medium term history, um, I don't think people have been building things as much. What can you say about the value of actually building things? Okay, so this the joke I like to say is in theory, there's not very much difference between simulation and building things. In practice, there is. Um, so the issue is building something and getting it to work is an enormous amount. Of work. It's an enormous amount. Of work. I, I was fortunate that I was at Stanford and we have large teams for these projects. Most people don't have that resources to do that. Um, I think there's huge value in actually building things because you figure out what really matters. Because oftentimes the thing that you're working on is not the thing that actually matters in the system. And you won't notice that until you actually try to build the system. But it's an enormous lift, and it's a couple of years and lots of student hours that often doesn't lead to publications. So I won't say that we should, shouldn't do what we're doing in terms of the non building things, but I think it's essential that we have groups that continue to do actual things. And one of the things I'm most interested in now is how do we facilitate that? The systems that we're basically all used to are incredibly complicated, take 
hundreds of millions of dollars for the hardware software base. We can't expect research groups to actually do that. The question is, how do we leverage some of that investment and allow people to play? Like, how do we make the transition like we made in the mid 80s when we went from full custom silica to ASICs, which allowed a lot of people to play in chips that couldn't play before? We have the same problem once again. The chips are way too complicated. What do we need to do to allow people to play? And I think the, the, the key is to realize that we're not building the system. The system is way too complicated. We're building an app on the system. And how do you facilitate apps, hardware software apps, on an existing platform? I think is really uh, a way forward. Anybody wants to talk to me about that. Uh, I don't know how to do it, but I think that's the answer. Hey, Mark. Yeah. It's part of the yeah. Google. Uh, really nice uh, talk. Thank you. Uh, so uh, your talk was very focused on technology and, uh, and systems. But I know you've also worked on uh, higher end applications. Like I know you dabbled in computation, for example. So how do you find killer apps? And where do you see the next big uh, killer app that's like not? <laughs> so the thing about killer apps is that killer apps are always uh, are always clear in hindsight, never in foresight. So I, I think the way you should do research, and it's not about killer apps, is to find problems that you think are important or matter, and that you think you have some insight in how to solve. I mean, digital photography is a world, right? And um, computational photography has taken over. The fact that you think your, your iPhone or your Android phone takes good pictures is a complete illusion, right? What happens is there's a tremendous amount of computation that goes on the pixels to make it look good. Uh, and that's been very important. But if I was thinking about things in the future, the problem is the future is unknown. And I can make predictions and not know better than anybody else. So what you should do is take a problem that you think is really interesting, that you think might affect the world, and work on it. Okay? And it may be a killer app, and it may not, but and you will find out later. I, I don't think. If I could do that prediction, I'd be a VC and I'd be very well. Mark. Mark Hill, uh, Microsoft Azure in Wisconsin. So I want to go to the other end of the stack. CMOS has been incredibly successful. All this stuff and technology is working in the lab, but scale enough to get enough economics to pay for Yeah, well, that's a, that's a great question. I'm been somewhat a silicon ticket, and I remember when all the face change memory came out, I couldn't figure out how it was going to so I just couldn't figure it out. Um, the big problem is that in order to do the technology development that you need to be a mainstream technology, it takes millions and millions of dollars. And there might be a better technology than CMOS out there, but I don't see any way of getting the investment necessary to develop the technology. Um, so the way technology change, I believe, happens is you get something that isn't actually painted, that builds up in a separate silo that ends up you know, doing things. Google started in advertising and search. You know, it ended up doing Chrome OS and all the apps and Microsoft, but they didn't initially aim to attack Microsoft. That doesn't mean that Microsoft didn't get attacked later. But, but that's the way it happens. So I think if something's going to challenge or become another technology, then it's going to have to have its own base someplace else to get it developed enough to do that. Um, so I, I hope my technology cards um, could be wrong, but I am betting that the technology for the next two decades is going to be serious. And I, I'm betting that it's not going to progress at the rate that it used to. And that has been lots of ramifications in basically the media industry. I, I wish it wasn't the case, but that's just what I see. Hi, Mark. Um, my name is Anshu. Yeah. Um, so, with, I guess my question is with the increase in the focus on sustainability, and given the fact that hardware manufacturing contributes to the bulk of the carbon footprint, I'm wondering what are your thoughts on how do we come up with hardware design in a way that makes things more sustainable? So I think that's a really interesting question. There's been some people in the beginning that's right to look at sustainability. 
I, I think what I would do first is figure out what percentage of the carbon output is actually caused by the silicon manufacturing process. Because one of the things is that we might be able to decrease that, but is that really a lever that if we decrease that, it will affect the problem at scale? Right. So I, I don't know that number. I think some of them might know that. But those are the kinds of things that I would be looking at first. Um, and then once we understand that, then we can think about what things we might do for mitigation. It, it's pretty clear that the carbon footprint for the devices that go in, you know, my pocket, your pocket, you know, it's probably set mostly by the manufacturer of those things. So but then, then you start thinking about, okay, well, how do we manufacture less stuff? Like, how do we use separate pieces of carbon? I, I think there's, I would look at the bigger picture to figure out where the best thing to just put this in. Hey, um, sure. I'm Trevor Crum from NVIDIA. I have a pretty simple question. Uh, I'm actually in the market for a garage door opener. Uh -huh. um, and it should be a solved problem. I have seen in the end of the world. It turns out it's really, really hard to do. You know, most of them are Wi Fi controlled. You have to actually register your username and password at the manufacturer's site. And I have no idea if they can or cannot control it from wherever they sit. I have no idea if it's server. Why cannot we have more localized solutions anymore? Uh, I, I got the opening, the, 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 the connection, I, I, I'm a little confused by. So we have lots of localized solutions. That's part of the problem. Like most of the garage door openers use the same integrated circuit and the same circuit. You know, that's what's mostly used every place. Now, if you want it connected to Bluetooth or something else, well, the things that are installed in most garage doors are compatible with the garage door wireless thing, not the Bluetooth thing, because the Bluetooth thing is more expensive than the uh, Garage door connect. Could it be different? Yeah. Could you put a little connector there? Yeah. Is there a chip that you probably could buy to do, do that? Yeah. But the system engineering to do that is going to take you some time and effort. So, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, the thing that I think about this whole situation is there's lots of room for innovation because there's lots of these kinds of things that people want to do. And probably the technology to do it is there. The, the question is getting that sick system. I guess together to, to do it. And I, I'm happy to talk to you a little bit more about exactly what the issue is. But, uh, I guess my question is why is there not a bigger market? Why does everything have to be combined with cloud based systems? Oh, no, you, you got it wrong. There is no reason that things have to be connected to cloud. The reason things are connected to cloud is financial. People connect up to cloud services to make money because everybody wants a service coming up. So it's it's not a technical issue, it's a, basically a business issue. So 